Life is complicated. Sometimes getting from A to B isn't as easy as just getting from A to B. In the book of Galatians, we find some great news. The most important areas of life don't have to be complicated. Keep it simple. Well, if you walked into Carrie's in my living room, right inside our front door, on the near side of that living room, we've got an end table with a very simple framed document on it. That, that document looks actually exactly like this. I brought it in. And so what it is, is it's our last name. We made it into an acronym. We wanted to just keep it in front of our family, keep it in front of our boys, keep it in front of us, where every letter of our last name, we, we put kind of a value next to it that we want to associate with that, along with a brief description of that value, and then a, and then a memory verse we just want to keep in mind as we think about, about that thing. So, so, so for example, W, right, WBW stands for wisdom, where we want to bring God's word to bear on all of life, even the difficult complicated parts of it. I stands for integrity. Who we are on the inside matters. The, the first E stands for edification. That's a mouthful, but it means that, that we build uh, uh, others up and we add value to their lives. The, the B stands for backbone, where we do what's right even when it's unpopular, uncomfortable, or uphill. And then the last E stands for enjoyment. We find joy and bring joy to the situations we're in. And here's our goal in doing that as a family. Our boys, now we've got four boys. Our boys are 16, almost 17, uh, 14, almost 15, and the twins are 13 years old. And they're, they're part of more and more situations that Carrie and I just simply aren't a part of ourselves. That They're making more and more decisions on their own. And so we want our boys to know that, that being a weeby means something. We, we want to build these, these fundamental truths into who they are, just kind of bake them into the batter a little bit. So that way, as they think about who am I, that they've got a compass to guide them and an anchor to tether them as they go into more and more of the situations where they make decisions and act on their own. Who am I? This isn't just a question for my family, just for my boys. This is a question for all of us, and it's not an abstract question. This question comes at us probably multiple times a week as we're introducing ourselves to strangers or getting to know the person in the cubicle next to us, getting to know a new roommate. But it's not only a question that comes at us. This is also a question that, that bubbles up from inside of us that we reflect on in our own personal quiet moments too. What job should I go after? Why, why aren't I satisfied? Why do I act differently around different kinds of people? What major should I pursue? All of these questions are really underneath this larger question of who am I? And here's why answering this question right is so important, because there are, there are dangers and drawbacks if we don't answer this question well. I mean, not knowing who you are, it might make you a chameleon where you are always adjusting who you are and how you act to fit the person you're around or the circumstance you're in. That's a tremendously confusing, disorienting way to live. It's frustrating probably to you. It's frustrating to the people who are around you. And it's not satisfying at all. Or not knowing who you are, it might make you think that it is entirely up to you by yourself and for yourself, to define who you are. And so this idea is very common today, right? That we construct 100% of our identity by ourselves or for yourselves. Just Google the phrase expressive individualism later today and you'll see how far down the rabbit hole that can take you. Now, there are all sorts of problems with this with this idea of complete self-creation, but, but the one that I'll talk about right now is just how exhausting it is. Alan Noble, he's recently written a book titled, You Are Not Your Own, Belonging to God in an Inhuman World. I've, I've actually referenced it a couple times on Sunday mornings. And in an interview, he wrote about, or he, he talked about why he wrote this book. So I'm a guy that doesn't only really read books. I listen to interviews about why people wrote books. So yeah, I'm, I'm that guy. But so in an interview, he's asked why he wrote this book. And here's one of his driving reasons. 
He says, I mentor a lot of students. Now, Alan Noble, he's a college professor at a Christian university. So he says, he says, I talk to a lot of students, and as I'm working with them, I'm realizing these Christian students are overwhelmed. They're burnt out. They're exhausted, depressed, highly anxious. A lot of their anxiety has to do with questions of, listen to this, has to do with questions of career and achievement. Their anxiety has to do with questions of identity. And so, so when we're responsible for our own self-creation, when, when that's up to us, it's tremendously overwhelming. It leads to burnout, it leads to anxiety, it leads to exhaustion. We aren't meant to live that way. But what if we can discover an identity that saves us from being a chameleon? So we're confident in who we are, and we don't always have to adjust ourselves to fit the person we're around. Or what if we can discover an identity that saves us from the exhaustion of self-creation? And what if this identity we discover is actually way better than any identity you would create for yourself? This is exactly where the book of Galatians takes us into this discovery of identity, what it means to be a child of God. So, so Jeff mentioned this last week as we wrapped up chapter two, but, but then as, as Paul turns the page, as he goes into chapter three, he continues to camp on this issue of identity. And so as we read the book of Galatians, just follow Paul's train of thought through it, which is a good way to read the Bible, just to follow the author's train of thought through it. As we do this, we discover Paul says so many more valuable things about our identity as children of God. So Paul talks about the source of identity, and he unpacks what it means to be the child of God. If you're taking notes, those are the two big points. The source of identity for the child of God and the meaning of our identity as children of God. But then listen to this. Paul isn't just talking to churches in Galatia in the first century. Brookside, Paul is talking to us Our identity needs to be rooted in the right soil because thin soil, what we root our identity in, will so quickly get pulled out. We need to discover the beauty and the security and the belonging of everything that it means to be a child of God. So let's look at that first point, the the source of our identity as the child of God. For this, let's look at Galatians chapter 3. I'm going to read verses 1 to 9. So so know in advance that Paul starts off very strong here for us in Galatians 3. Look at what he says. He says, you foolish Galatians, who's bewitched you? Now, uh, up to this point in Galatians, for the last chapter and a half, Paul has been talking about himself, about his own experiences, about how the gospel has radically transformed his own life and some circumstances he's had around that. But, but now, it's like he, he looks the Galatians straight in the eye again, and he gets their attention. You foolish Galatians, who's, who's bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. And so Paul starts off like this because he knows how serious the thing he's writing about is. He's writing about the gospel, the core of the core of the core of what Christianity is all about. This is a big deal. And so Paul needs to be serious. Paul needs to get their attention because there is so much at stake with this. And then Paul involves them. He he asks the Galatians, he asks us a series of questions. Verse two, he says, I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law? Or by believing what you've heard? And now this is a rhetorical question. The Galatians know the answer. They didn't receive the Spirit through the works of the law. Paul's already talked about that. They received the Spirit through faith, by believing. And then verse 3, Are you so foolish after beginning by means of the Spirit, which you received by faith, remember, after beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? And again, the answer is obvious. Paul is driving them and us back to the primacy and centrality of faith. 
Christianity is faith at the start. Christianity is faith in Jesus, what he's done all the way through the finish line. Verse 4, now I'll stop interrupting myself so often. So verse 4, have you, have you experienced so much in vain if it really was in vain? So again I ask you, does God give you a spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by your believing what you heard? So also Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw all the way back, beginning of our Old Testaments, that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith, those who believe, are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. And then now a dominant theme of this passage is faith. And let, let me help you feel that in ways that are maybe even stronger than what I just read. So the, the Greek word for faith is this word pistis. I pulled out my Greek New Testament earlier this week, was studying how many times this Greek word pistis, which can be translated faith, trust, believe, it's all the same Greek root word pistis. I counted how many times pistis pops up in what I just read. And in nine verses, that word or some form of it, some form of it is used seven times. Paul is driving this stake, this anchor of faith deeply into the ground for the Galatians and for us. He's pointing them to faith and trust in God and away from their own works as the way they earn favor with God. And so this is all just driving home again and again and again. Just imagine a sledgehammer pounding a stake into the ground again and again and again. Paul is just driving this home that the source of our identity isn't your performance It's not what you do. The source of our identity is the gospel, what Jesus has done. The gospel is the initial source of our identity. This is the power that enables us to be transferred from the the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of God's son whom he loves. The gospel is is the power that enables us to be transformed from people who who are actually, the Bible says, enemies of God, resistant to him, and to be transferred into new creations who have God's spirit. And if you're new to church, that transformation of our identity at the most fundamental level, that should be amazing, jaw-dropping, good news. And if you've been following Jesus for decades, that should still be amazing jaw-dropping, good news. We never move past the beauty, the, the amazing nature of God's grace through faith. But don't miss that Paul doesn't stop there. He doesn't just talk about the initial source of our identity, right? How, how, that, how that switch gets flipped. Paul doesn't say the gospel is the initial source for our identity and then, and then move on to something else. Paul says the gospel is the initial source of our transformed identity, and the gospel is the ongoing source of our transformed identity. And this is so important to grasp, because if you're anything like me, you you maybe get, like you understand that, yeah, you're saved by grace through faith, but then we slip in again and again and again into this mindset of, yeah, but, but I'm kept in God's good graces by what I did or didn't do yesterday or last week. So sure, I'm, I'm on the team through grace, but I stay on the team through my performance. So, so sure, I'm saved by grace, past tense, but I'm, I'm kept in God's good graces, present tense, by my performance, by what I do. Brookside, that is not what Paul is saying here. Paul is saying the same faith that I need in trusting the gospel initially is the same faith I need and continue to show in trusting the gospel last week, today, next week, and 10 years from now. We never graduate from faith in the gospel. The object of our faith doesn't go from Jesus' work to my performance. The object of our faith is always the gospel. 
That's why Paul says what he does in that last verse I read, verse 9. Those who rely on faith, those who believe, are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. We're brought into God's family by faith, and we are kept in God's family by faith in Jesus' finished work on the cross. This truth offers such freedom, such a sense of belonging, such security. Some of you have been following Jesus for a long time. But, but you would say, it's exhausting. I can't keep up with my expectations. You, I know you can't. You're not supposed to. You're trying to keep yourself in God's good graces by your effort, by what you do. And for sure, hear me say this. Let me just get this out. Good works are important. The gospel shouldn't lead us to laziness or license. We should grow in holiness and good works. But God loves you. God accepts you. Not because of your good works. It's never the case that that's the case. God, God loves you. And God accepts you 100%, always, because of what Jesus has done for you. And so rest in the assurance of what Jesus has done. Others of you listening, you've been holding off on seriously considering Christianity. Because you think Christianity is just some set of rules. Or, or you don't want to be rejected. You wonder, like, what, what happens if I mess up? You, you know you can't keep up with everything that Christ says in this book. That's why we need grace. Christianity isn't a set of rules. It's not about what you do. So let me encourage you, challenge you to look at Christianity not as a set of rules, but as a life that overflows because of what Jesus has already done for us. The source of our identity is the gospel. The gospel is the initial source for our identity. And the gospel is always the ongoing source of our identity. Second point, the meaning of our identity as a child of God. So here's what I want to, here's what I want to focus in on. What it, what it means to be, to be God's child through faith. Well, what does this offer? Who am I? Who are we as God's children? Let me read Galatians 3.26. We're going to read just the first few verses here. Then we're going to sit and camp in Galatians 4, 1 through 7. But Galatians 3.26 is so good. Let me put it in front of you. Here's what the Bible says. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And so if you belong to Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So we'll get into chapter 4 here in just a second, but here are some highlights from those verses we just looked at at the end of Galatians 3. We see again the primacy of faith. That sledgehammer keeps driving the anchor in. Faith is that big of a deal. We've been clothed with Christ. So when God looks at us, when God looks at you, he sees Jesus and what Jesus has done. And we see the unity and equal access that believers have to Jesus Christ that apply across all of our differences without erasing those differences. But now here's chapter 4. Verse 1, what I'm saying, Paul continues, is that as long as an heir is underage, he's no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also when we were underage, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are God's child, God has made you also an heir. 
So in verses 1 to 3 of that, Paul is talking about life apart from Jesus. He, he says we're in slavery to these elemental spiritual forces of the world. What does that mean? Here's how one commentary explains what, what these elemental spiritual forces of the world are talking about. Listen to this. He says, he says we were in bondage to vain philosophies, man-made codes of ethics, legalistic interpretations of the law, and demon-inspired religions that brought nothing but hopelessness and despair. So the bottom line is that the picture is dark apart from Jesus. Apart from Jesus, life isn't free and fun. Instead, Paul says, actually, it's a kind of slavery that ultimately leaves us empty. Like, like empty on the inside, empty. And then verse 4 is this huge hinge. But when the set time had fully come in God's perfect and providential timing, when the set time had fully come, God sent his son. Jesus changes everything. And then in verses 5 to 8, we see three big ways Jesus changes our identity. These are true of anyone who has placed their faith in Jesus. So if, if you're a Christian, if, you, if you've placed your faith in Jesus, if you, if you follow him as your Savior and Lord, write these down. These are true of you. So what does it mean to be a child of God? First, Paul says it means redemption. In your Bibles, underline that word redeem in verse 5. Jesus came to redeem those under the law, which in the argument of Galatians is all of us by the way. So Jesus came to offer redemption. And this word for redeem here, it means to release a slave from his or her owner by paying the slave's full price. And so when people in Galatia would have heard this, it would have brought images to their mind of a slave market. Just, just think how, how horrible that was. Somebody walks in a slave, but then they're purchased they're redeemed and they walk out free. Their identity has been completely transformed. You maybe can relate to that feeling of being enslaved, of feeling enslaved, not literally, but, but maybe to some event in your past that haunts you. Maybe to some sin that you feel like, that, that sin owns me. Because we all know that, that as attractive as sin first looks, it doesn't take long before we feel trapped in that sin. Talk to addicts. They get it. Sin owns us. And so it is this beautiful, like, like be I chose that word intentionally, it is this beautiful truth that Jesus offers redemption. You aren't owned by that event from your past. You aren't owned by that sin. Instead, Jesus, through his perfect, final, and finished sacrifice on the cross, Jesus paid the price, and you are redeemed in Christ. Second, being a child of God means adoption. Adoption. Underline that word adoption in your Bibles. It's good to write in your Bibles. Jot down notes in the margins. Underline that word adoption. Jesus redeemed us, it says, so that we might receive adoption to sonship. That, that means our legal status changes when we follow Jesus. And so now God sees us as his sons and daughters. A friend of mine who's gone through the adoption process, he, he shared with me this last week, how adopting his kids helps him understand what Paul is talking about when, when we're called adopted as God's children. Here's what he wrote me. He said, personally, one of the things that rang out loud and clear to me in the adoption process was the judge's gavel coming down at the end of our adoption court hearing. I mean, so such a vivid picture, that, that judge's gavel coming down. He, he continues, up to that point, I loved and cared for this little girl who had been a guest in our home, but the, but the judge had the authority in that moment to declare a new identity for this girl. She was now my daughter, and I was struck by the finality and permanence of that and realizing that when God adopted me into his family through Christ, 
it was the same kind of transaction. Like a judge's gavel saying, you're now my son, and this is final and permanent, and it changes your identity. Our identity permanently changes. It is, it is secure when we trust in Christ because of what he's done for us. But there's also this subjective aspect to this truth that we're adopted. Like, like, like it should change our experience. We should feel something. It should, it should do something inside of us. Let me read verse 6 again. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. This very intimate, familial language for father there. And so our identity as adopted sons and daughters. It's not just some idea we hold out at arm's length. Say, hmm. That's interesting. And then get on with our day. It should do something in us to know that our identity has been been changed because of Jesus. This has everything to do with personal relationship, with, with belonging, with knowing there is always someone with a capital S that you can turn to. I love this quote from Charles Spurgeon. He was a 19th century preacher over in England. So it's just good to have people from from outside of our own timeline speak into our lives today. So here's Spurgeon on this verse. He says, Sonship sealed by the indwelling spirit brings us peace and joy. Listen to all the ways he, he, he draws out the difference that sonship makes. Brings peace and joy. It leads to nearness to God and fellowship with him. It excites trust, love, vehement desire, and creates in us reverence, obedience, and actual likeness to God. All this and much more because the Holy Spirit has come to dwell in us. And so Paul, or or Spurgeon, is just reflecting on this verse, and then suddenly he erupts into into worship. Listen to how he continues. He says, oh, matchless mystery. Had it not been revealed, it never would have been imagined. And now that it is revealed, it never would have been believed if it had not become a matter of actual experience to those who are in Christ Jesus. That's what adoption offers. That's the spirit in us. So as a child of God, we are redeemed. We are adopted. And finally, being a child of God means inheritance. That's how verse 7 ends. Since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. Underline that word, heir. This has everything to do with hope and confidence in the future. In a world where war is real. We feel that. In in a world where pandemics happen. in, In a world where anxiety is increasing. In a world where people close to us die. In that sort of world, Christians still believe in hope. The Bible, because of our identity, gives us reason to believe that the future is bright. Now, this isn't a naive naive hope. You might be able to say, you might be saying, Tim, how can you even say that? Of course, we still deal with the things that are in front of us. All the issues that need attention in a world where sin is a reality in all the different ways sin ripples out in the world. But we believe the future is bright because because the resurrection of Jesus Christ has happened. And the future, what that means, along with a lot of other things, what that means is the future has broken into the present. The future is secure because Christ has risen from the dead. And we know God is faithful to his promises. I've got some extended family who are missionaries in the the Ukraine in Kiev. And they're home now. Uh, They actually came back for a planned year-long time in the States to visit supporting churches. So they've been back for six months or nine months. But they've been talking a lot with with the church in Kiev where, where they serve. And here's what this family member posted on Facebook. Uh, with a kind of a private family site. She said, at the end of this phone conversation with this pastor in Kiev, this pastor Nikolai, listen to this, he remarked 
at the end of our phone conversation with a tone of song in his voice. This was yesterday, after war had started and after missiles are launched. He ended the, song, the conversation with a tone of song in his voice. This pastor says, we are not panicking. God is at work and we are at peace. How can he say that? How can somebody say that when everything is as fragile and as scary and as real as it is? Issues need attention. We get it. But he's saying we have hope. Christians believe God is faithful to his promises. And so we look ahead in hope to our identity as redeemed, adopted heirs because of what Jesus has done. So Carrie and I, we made our WeBe acronym document because we wanted our boys to know that being a WeBe means something. And our, our prayers of this identity, these things we're trying to bake into the batter of who they are, we, we pray that these truths about their identity would shape how they think about themselves, how they process things that come at them, and how they make decisions on their own. That these truths about who we are as children of God should do the same thing in us. They should influence how we process things, how we make decisions, and the things that we value. Our identity is rooted. Its source is in the good news of the gospel. We are declared righteous before God by grace through faith in Jesus. And we are kept in God's good favor by grace through faith in Jesus' finished work on the cross. Being a child of God, it means redemption. Your past doesn't own you. That event, that sin, you're not trapped in it. Jesus' perfect sacrifice of himself has redeemed us as his children. We're redeemed from slavery to sin, and we can find forgiveness and confidence before God. And so as God's child, you are redeemed. It means adoption. You're in the family of God with all the, with all the intimacy, the belonging, the security that that, op- that that offers. Nothing can take that away. And you always have someone, a heavenly father, who is perfect that you can turn to. As a child of God, you are adopted. And finally, it means inheritance. God has good planned for you. You can look forward in hope to a bright future in eternity moving forward. And so who are you? As a child of God, you're an heir. If you're not a follower of Jesus, this identity can be yours today by by confessing your sins, placing your faith in Jesus, and following him as your Savior and Lord. And if you are a follower of Jesus, let's keep pounding this anchor of our identity more and more deeply into our lives and our hearts and how we think about ourselves and how we interact with others. Being a child of God means something. It is wonderful and powerful and transforming all at once. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we have nothing to say but thank you for changing our identity in ways that only you can, along with all the different ways you've made us unique as individuals, we thank you for these anchors in our life, that our hope is in the gospel, that we can find redemption and forgiveness, that we are adopted and we have an inheritance with with hope in a bright future. And so Jesus, just, just again, or maybe for the first time, we say it is only because of you that we have these things and thank you so much for the identity that is secure because of your work. We love you, Jesus. Pray these things in your name. Amen.